And we will continue with the next speaker, Assistant Professor Dr. Antonio Moraira Taishaira from um, Universidad Aberta from Portugal, where he works in the Educational and Distance Learning Department. He is also currently an Executive Committee member of European Distance Education Network, or EDEN. From 2006 to 2009, he was the Pro-Rector for Innovation in Distance Learning at his university. Dr. Taishira holds a PhD in Philosophy by the University of Lisbon and is a member of the university's Philosophy Research Center. Additionally, he has received advanced training in online tutoring from the University of Turku. He is a board member of several international research journals on digital future, as well as a member of EASM Network and several task forces at European Association of Distance Teaching University and the Portuguese Rectors Council. And today, he will be um, giving the presentation on the topic of the importance of open educational resources for lifelong learning, wider access, new business models, and international collaboration culture. Please welcome Assistant Professor Dr. Antonio Moraira Taishaira. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, the perfect presentation in perfect Portuguese, which is not very, it, we, we seldom see. <laughs> So congratulations, and uh, well, hello everybody. Um, uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, the, uh, um, the Commission for Higher Education uh, of Thailand, and uh, the, also the, the Thai uh, Cyber University, and most especially uh, the colleagues from, from the Thai Cyber University have been marvelous hosts, and we're all quite happy with with, uh, with, with the conference and of course, uh, I guess that we all share this uh, many thanks to you. Well, um, I, I cannot compete with my colleague from Estonia because uh, Portugal didn't invent Skype, so I cannot, I don't have anything to offer to Boam Kim. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I guess I have something that she doesn't have. I'm, I come from, from Portugal, which is a country that, uh, as you most surely know, has a lot, a long standing tradition of, of uh, cooperation, of, uh, of also a friendship with Asia and uh, uh, especially, of course, with, with, with Thailand. Um, my, in my presentation uh, today, uh, I would like to address uh, the issue of open educational resources. As you know, uh, this has already been um, uh, addressed by previous keynote speakers. Uh, uh, would, um, so probably some of the, the things I would like to, to address have already been uh, um, addressed as well by uh, previous speakers. But anyway, I think, I suppose that um, the perspective uh, of, of from which uh, I'm going to address the issue is a little bit, a little bit different. I tried to, um, to, uh, so to, to use that point of view of linking open educational resources to the need of retraining uh, our human resources. Um, this is the, uh, well, uh, I'll try to, to be uh, more, probably more brief than the, the, the originally uh, expected. So I'll, tr I'll just uh, start by um, presenting you the, the contents. Basically, I'll, 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 I, I divided it, uh, my presentation in four, uh, four big areas. First of all, um, this, this area I've entitled the ongoing global confluence of systems. Then I'll try to um, address more specifically the uh, theme of OER, uh, starting by uh, the relationship between OER and the Education for All goal of UNESCO. And then uh, speak, uh, speak a little bit about the, 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 the evolution of the OER, uh, not just the OER movement, but the OER notion and concept. And finally, try to address a little bit the relationship that I think it is quite uh, strategic between OER and lifelong learning. So starting by this uh, first topic, the gl global confluence of systems. Well, basically, um, in Europe, and I'm sure also here in Asia, 
the, the, the ongoing crisis, the economical crisis, has started to, um, or, or made people starting to fear globalization. And, started, uh, and people started to ask themselves if really this was going to be the way into the future. And many people, especially in Europe, started to see uh, globalization as a big threat and started to think on how are we going to defend ourselves from globalization and from global effects. Well, basically, what can be already be said, uh, bearing in mind the, 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 the latest events, especially the last year, is that, of course, globalization has its, can also have its damages. Anyway, what happened really uh, in, 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 uh, in relation to the economical crisis is that people started to see, to see globalization, I mean, started to understand e even on a more deeper level the importance of globalization. So if globalization, on a, uh, an economical point of view, can, of course, bring some damages, and we've seen uh, how they can be uh, quite damaging. Um, what we should conclude from that is not that globalization has to be stopped, but we have to find global, a, a global answer to the, the global threats that really uh, um, uh, nowadays we, 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 we face. So basically, although, um, of course, everyone uh, feels quite um, um, afraid of, of, the, of the effects of globalization, and especially of the globalization of markets and the economy, that di didn't stop, on the, on the opposite, that didn't stop these four things, which are basically the globalization of communication and knowledge, it's, it's still running, the flexibility and harmonization of the economy and the employment market, as you, uh, as you know, uh, basically uh, some of the, uh, uh, well, probably the answer of companies to uh, ec the economical crisis was to relocate, and that means that this flexibility and harmonization of the economy is still going on, and probably even increasing. Also the increase of physical and virtual mobility of citizens, I mean, even, even the recent uh, uh, pandemic hasn't stopped people from traveling, on the opposite. And of course, the opening of the innovation systems, and the, 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 the previous speakers during this session have noted quite, quite clearly the importance of sharing our knowledge, sharing our, our know-how, sharing our ex expertise. And so basically, innovation, even in, in, in companies, are becoming ever more shared. And so the, 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 the innovation systems are opening up. So basically, what, we, uh, uh, what probably we face today is this enormous challenge. And this challenge is, to retrain, the, uh, in face of this, uh, this co the consequences of this uh, global crisis, economical crisis, we have to face this retraining of the current labor force in the world. And as fast as companies and business relocate, as I've told you, uh, I was uh, saying before, professionals, uh, workers, whatever, have to adjust to a new cultural environment, new jobs and learn new skills, but they have to do it cons uh, permanently, constantly. So to assure long-term sustainability for our global human resources, we have to assure that all people can rapidly and continuously, and that is very important, develop new internationally validated competences. That is also important. It's, uh, it's not just important to d develop th these competences, but they have to be international validated, or else we cannot go across countries and uh, uh, search for uh, job, jobs, for instance. How can we do this? Uh, I'll try to, to sum up a little bit of this part because uh, I don't have too much time. Basically, uh, it, this can be addressed or should be addressed by a global commitment of governments, of companies, and of organizations. One of, uh, one of the um, possibly um, a paradigm that could be used as a good example is what happened in Europe regarding the, the, the building up of the European, what we call the European higher education area. As you know, the European higher education area states that uh, uh, an association of nations, of countries, 
established a, a rule, uh, uh, established a system in which every student can freely um, enroll in, uh, during the course of a program in different universities, and so they can transfer from universities without having any problems in that. Also, their, their qualifications are valid in every country. And of course, they are, recognized, they are acknowledged by every institution. This European higher education area, in a way, uh, was the first, the first step to a, a network, a, beginning of a building of a network of European universities, and of course, European research institutions and so on. The, uh, this European higher education area was built upon these three basic principles. General, uh, uh, general uh, excuse me, <laughs> generality versus specialization of, of education, flexibility for training, and professional mobility. As you, uh, as you may know, this was intended at first as Europe, I mean, uh, as gov uh, the governments of Europe, and especially the European Commission, understood that Europe was uh, lacking behind. And so they, uh, they had to transform Europe in a very competitive uh, zone in the globe, a very competitive area. So the first, uh, first uh, choice would be to, uh, to start an, a, a very um, a reform in education that would allow for uh, qualifications and uh, education to become much more effective. With these, so with these three principles, uh, the EU intended to, first of all, increase employability and diversification of job options for graduates, and secondly, lifelong learning, making easier professional development and retraining. That's how it was started in Europe, uh, basically, as, as, a, as a, p a political issue, the, the, the topic of lifelong learning. And so it was established even prior to the uh, current economical crisis. As you may know, um, it, it started in Lisbon with the, the famous Lisbon Agenda. So, uh, rega I mean, but anyway, this puts a new, a new problem regarding higher education institutions, because the, this new culture of lifelong learning changes in almost entirely the way the uh, universities and other higher ed education institutions tend to, tended to operate. First of all, these, uh, I uh, just summed up in four uh, challenges that I uh, think are new for higher education institutions in Europe. First of all, there should be a link in the global network for the production, reproduction, and preservation of knowledge, and not, as before, just a center for knowledge production and transmission. And so they should start to recycle instead of generating knowledge. That is a, a, complete, a, a, a very important transformation in the, the, the idea itself of uh, what was a, a higher education um, institution and how it operated. Secondly, the, the, these institutions, or universities in this sense, should be not just, uh, as, as in the past, a factory in the sense that they produced qualifications, but basically uh, what we call, I call the learning shop, there is a, a place where anyone could go at any time and acquire not just qualifications, but um, accreditation. Uh, bearing in mind that these institutions should become um, accreditors of uh, long life uh, learning. So thirdly, they should de develop and offer different learning solutions and not just a typical learning offer. Different learning solutions for the various qualification needs, being correct uh, curricular structures or not, being formal or non-formal kinds of learning. F uh, fourthly, uh, or, uh, and lastly, uh, these institutions have, or universities, should specialize their mission and offer. And so, it, in a way, they lose some of the, its universal, uh, universality. Bon, well, in this sense, higher education institutions tended to develop uh, into a new kind of, uh, of organizations, organizations that f uh, basically do not have a time or a, p a place uh, specifically, and permanently are uh, uh, available, in, uh, permanently available to anyone who needs to learn. So uh, this, w w this would uh, bring us to three uh, main uh, uh, conclusions in this sense. A university or a higher education institution in, ge in general should have a new mission addressing long, long, life, long life learning and should adapt their organizations and business models to it. 
Also, they have to form new and strong alliances and collaborate with companies. That's a, an important issue. Non-governmental organizations and government in itself in order to address qualification needs. And that means that universities and higher education institutions in general have to reach out for society and try to understand what they need. Also, they should be on and in the web, not just on the web, but they should be also uh, linking it, uh, each other. And this brings us to uh, an important topic. If we have, on one hand, this important challenge of retraining the global uh, workforce in the sense, and, at the, and the secondly, if we understand that we basically live in a, a knowledge society and in a network society, what could be the best way to achieve this? Well, uh, probably one of the best ways, and we have been addressing this uh, th uh, throughout the day, is the use, but a strategic use, and not just the use as, a, as, a, as a, another more tool, of open educational resources. And this, uh, I, I just um, selected this, um, this quotation from um, uh, a, a government plan. This is from India, the National Knowledge Commission, the recommendation submitted in 2007 um, to in what, they, what is called the report to the nation. So it, it, this is an example of how a country, how a nation, uh, uh, understands this, uh, this need understands how open education resources can be used, understand how can be, um, how a strategy must be developed and in, uh, implemented. This is a quotation of, of their report. So uh, as, as, uh, as, as, um, as they said, as the, committee, uh, the commission said, our success, in this case of India's, but it can be applied to every uh, country, uh, as you know, our success in the knowledge economy hinges to a large extent on upgrading the quality and enhancing, of course, the access to education. One of the most effective ways of achieving this would be to simulate, of course, the development of this dissemination of quality open access. And, uh, of course, this is important because uh, regarding research, this is quite uh, strategically important and uh, materials and open educational resources, of course, through broadband, internet connectivity, and so on. This, would, uh, this of course, um, uh, the can be, uh, this kind of, uh, of thinking can be uh, nowadays uh, find, found in most of the countries. But w what is interesting here is the strategic uh, uh, deployment of this, threat, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this notion. This same committee, uh, this same commission, uh, in the same report, um, uh, subsequently um, put forward four basic recommendations regarding the implementation of OER. These are, uh, first of all, that a set of key institutions in their country should be selected and experts representing the, the diverse knowledge areas, well, like these ones, should be asked to develop standards-based content, um, which of course has to be customized to diverse, diverse user needs. Also, that this initiative should not just be a national one, but should be also uh, an in, uh, initiative that could produce resources available for global use, and that is quite important these days. Also, that uh, this, uh, the, the content, uh, of course, will be multimedia, interactive, available in different languages, and that is one of the most uh, difficult topics regarding these issues, uh, uh, the localization of the, of the resources. And, of course, and that probably is the most important thing, that to speed up this creation, adaptation, and utilization of OER, they should implement a national EO e-content and curriculum initiative. And so what they understood uh, from the start is that in order to do this correctly, they had to train, to, to build a faculty and to train people to build OERs. And that is a, an interesting point that I would like to, 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 to make at this stage. Because that's, that brings us with, in connection with uh, what has been achieved by the ICD Global Task Force on OER. This is the result uh, or s some of the, the, the data of the inquiry they, the ICD made in 2007, late 2007, early 2008, 
uh, as you know, the ICD is the International Council for Distance Education, and in a way it represents most of the important distance education um, in, uh, institutions in, in, in the world. And so basically, uh, of course, uh, what, what, what they seemed, I mean, what they understood is that if this was going to be uh, a strategic option, a strategic decision, the use of open educational resources uh, uh, global-wide, uh, they, they, as uh, dedicated distance learning uh, institutions, should start to address this on a strategic way. And so they launch an inquiry uh, uh, in its, um, within its members. And these are the results that were, were, were achieved. First of all, everyone, uh, or most of the, uh, of the, of the universities that were, uh, re responded to the inquiry, had a clear no, uh, notion of the opportunities that the OER movement presented us. Uh, basically, these are what they, they've, uh, sorry, there's a, okay. No, this <laughs> is, okay. Um, basically, the, the easy access to quality content, reaching a wider audience, of course, cost effectiveness, um, greater volume of learning, learning resources, quality of learnings can be obtained by nation and institutions with scarce financial resources, which was a very important thing for the ICDE uh, in terms of capacity of building and so on, flexibility, uh, and the opportunity for sharing uh, available resources. Because one of the things that they understand the most, it's building resources, producing resources, is a very costly thing. And so uh, if we're going to have to produce in a large quantity good quality uh, learning resources, we should be starting to share our own capability of producing them. But of course, they understood as well that there are threats, and these are the, the, the main ones according to, to, to these institutions. Of course, copyrights and intellectual property rights uh, issues. Uh, it's already been addressed uh, in, during one of the, the previous, uh, by one of the previous um, speakers. Um, of course, quality, and this is a, a major issue. Um, cultural domination, globalization. I mean, this is, again is the, uh, brings us to the, the problem of the language, because basically uh, these resources are available in English, and that of course can bring some cultural domination issues. Lack of, uh, and that is also quite important, the lack of a viable business model. And uh, of course, uh, also uh, these are the conclusions, uh, well-known brand institutions may attract more students than the others and so on. Lack of initiative and content is not the same as learning materials. And this is a very important thing because they understood that um, basically what had been happening is that institutions worldwide and researchers and, and teachers and professors were producing a large amount of, uh, of resources, putting them on the web, but without understanding really how a, re a learning resource is built. And so basically, a lot of, thing were, of things were available, but without any, I mean, things that had, of course, scientific uh, quality, but didn't have pedagogical quality. So in a way, they were useless for learning, although they were uh, quite good materials as such. And so that uh, brought them to these two major questions. How can OER contribute in responding to the Education for All UNESCO policy and to capacity building as well as widening participation and access? And secondly, what role can it be attributed to OER in developing or strengthening a knowledge-based society? This was answered basically by this conclusion. OER clearly cannot be seen as just making freely available on the web classroom learning materials. This, does, this doesn't replicate, of course, the full learning experience of a student. That uh, brings us to the, the, um, the beginning of this movement. As you, under, as you well know, this all started with the MIT OpenCourseWare. And basically, what happened at first with the MIT OpenCourseWare and became uh, widely, uh, widely copied was that uh, uh, just a, a teacher used some of the materials uh, that were used in, in a classroom, put it on the web, and well, that, that's, that was it. But that wasn't really the, the thing because it started a, a wrong idea, a wrong notion that the people were ge ge getting access to what MIT was really producing. And 
really getting access to MIT material, as, as that one, wasn't really getting access to MIT education because there was a lack of, uh, uh, it was lacking a very important issue that was the all the, all the cultural uh, thing, all the env learning environment that was being offered to a MIT student. Of course, at the beginning, as you know, this was basically a marketing scheme. So the MIT uh, put it on the web their materials and that uh, in, a in a way attracted more students uh, for the MIT, uh, to enroll in the MIT courses because they, they in a way, the MIT uh, um, uh, beca become a dominant brand. But that, of course, was just a marketing scheme. So is this uh, what OER has to offer? Of course it hasn't. Uh, of course it isn't, sorry. So uh, what OER has to be defined is, as is OER has to be defined as making openly available on the web a full set of learning resources specifically designed to enable self-learning experience. And that was the part where open uh, and uh, distance learning uh, institutions and universities uh, mainly uh, become aware of this and understand that, of course, open educational resources could be a fundamental and strategic of, of, of fundamental and strategic importance to widen, widen up access to education, but they were, were only use, useful if they were really produced properly, produced as good learning resources. And so they had to be produced by people who had that ex expertise, institutions that had also that, that, that those, the facilities to produce those, uh, those, those good resources, and also understanding the value of the knowledge life cycle. So basically, a good content is different from a good resource. And so, uh, uh, content can be, uh, can be put in, I mean, several resources can be designed, can be produced from a good content. And that reuse of content uh, was the trick that the open and uh, distance learning uni universities understood that they had to be uh, using in order to establish a good strategy, a effective strategy of using open educational resources as really uh, um, uh, 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 for achieving the goal of widening access to real effective education and learning. Of course, this new OER notion replaced a conventional teacher-centered content uh, approach, which was basically the one that allowed for a teacher to, to put, just put on the web what he had produced. But that, uh, that of course, had to be changed to, to a learning-centered content design, making, of course, that, in that sense, easier for, uh, to meet UNESCO's uh, Education for All goal. But also it has to do with uh, the, 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 the emergence of the web 2.0 uh, tools is, uh, of course, this uh, brought a new, um, a new movement, a, a new culture of participation, of uh, rebuilding, of reusing, uh, and that, of course, couldn't be uh, met by the old uh, teacher-centered um, model. Of course, this, uh, in order to just to, um, to, to, to become it more clear what I'm trying to, to say, uh, I would um, submit this, uh, this kind of typology of open, of open content resources. So there is a first generation that I would uh, basically, we could call it open courseware, and it is basically free access to materials produced by high profile education institutions in order to support face to face teaching. That is basically what the MIT has done, that is basically for marketing reasons. A second generation emerged from the, uh, the, these new development by open uh, uh, universities. And this generation can be called open content resources. So in this sense, this, these are free access to materials produced by single or network education institutions or editors in order to support autonomous independent learning in the context of open learning, distance learning, or e-learning. And of course, these, as we are uh, going, uh, going to try to, uh, to uh, show in a, in a minute, this is, was a, a very important changing of what we can understand as open educational resources. Thirdly, and it, it has already been addressed by a previous speaker, we, uh, we've started a third generation where the content is being generated by the user themselves. And so the, the, we could, in this sense, uh, define open content resources as free access by expert individuals or 
organizations to materials produced for independent learning for use and redesign. Because this is the main thing. This has to be designed for independent learning or else it's useless. This, of course, is the, well, this is the well-known uh, site, website of the MIT OpenCourseWare. Um, this, in a way, could represent that first generation. This is the, uh, the, the, the site of the OpenLearn uh, uh, initiative by the Open uh, University in the UK. I, as you see, it's basically um, a, a portal that gives access to two Moodle platforms uh, or LMSs, which, is, which one uh, um, basically is, a, a one of which is, um, a, a, well, um, uh, gives access to courses and the other gives access to resources in order to reuse uh, them. And uh, of course, the Open Learn experience, the, the Open Learn was the, the initiative uh, put forward by the Open University. Uh, it has already been um, uh, shown uh, or been addressed in a previous uh, uh, presentation. We could, uh, we could sum up this experience by the three uh, conclusions. It really serve to increase access and, uh, of, in that sense, lifelong learning. Because as you know, uh, and through, in its first 18 months, so in the first year and a half, over, it had over 2 million visitors and 60,000 registered users. And that resulted in over 4,500 uh, 4, new registrations in formal courses. That means these visitors, they started to visit the website, they started to use the material, they started to use it, um, they, 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 they registered uh, as users, and finally, the same uh, or uh, an important part of these users become new students at the Open University, new formal students at the Open University. Students that they would, they would be students if they wouldn't be get access first to those materials and started to learn from them. Uh, secondly, it, 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 uh, this open learning experience um, uh, promoted the development of, a new pedagogical uh, of new pedagogical methods and it has been used as a very powerful tool for not just for, um, for learning but also for in uh, educational entertainment of present and future students, of course. Um, because it, it even teachers at the University, uh, of the Open University, st started to use open education, their open educational resources as resources of their own courses which is uh, a curious thing. Thirdly, this, develop, uh, uh, this initiative uh, allowed the development of a new model for the relationship between university and society. Because this was a, a strategic institutional, uh, um, uh, sorry, an institutional strategy, and it, it, so the, the, the university itself used it on a strategic way, and so it, it, it um, the, the economical and uh, uh, scientific sustainability of the, of, the, of the learning of these open educational resources was assured by the fact that I the institution itself was using it on a strategic way, and so in including it in its own um, um, or operational model. This is the site of the the, the well, what we could. Uh, um, uh, designate as the Dutch response to the open education uh, to the um, open learn initiative. This is the open uh, ER, which is the uh, in a way the open learn of the Dutch open in, uh, university. This is, is a very small, sc a smaller scale initiative, but it was in quite interesting because, um, uh, well, these are some of the results. But basically, what is more interesting in, in this is that not just the institution itself used OER as, a, as a, a tool to promote access to its own courses and offer, but the government, the Dutch government, used uh, in, in cooperation, of course, with the Open uh, um, University of the Netherlands, used this uh, initiative as a way of r rapidly retraining large amounts of, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of professionals of really of, um, of labor of, of the labor force. Uh, I see now that my time is up. I will try to sum up uh, the the last things. Um, this is something that I would like just to to make a brief comment. 
Um, these initiatives, both the, the, the British initiative and the Dutch initiative, led to the development of the moral, in a way, of the moral project. The moral project is an EADTU, European Association of Distance Teaching Universities initiative. That's basically uh, the main characteristic, uh, and it's interesting as such, um, um, was that uh, the same resource, the, the same open educational resource, could be used for different uses. In this sense, the same course, you could get access to this course and just uh, use it as um, a, another open education resource uh, portal. But at the same time, if you, the same course could be transformed in formal education if you just applied for, for, to the university and asked for, uh, to, to be accredited, uh, for your learning to be accredited. So you could uh, enroll in that same course that is, was an, uh, an open course, an open educational resource course, and uh, of course get access to formal tutoring and examination and uh, so transform that non-formal educational uh, tool into a formal qualifications um, pro 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 course or program. Of course, this uh, just uh, brings us to, um, uh, in my view, to the, uh, um, a topic which I believe it's quite important, which is if we getting to use these open education resources as, a f as formal training as well, or formal education, we have to, we're bound to uh, open education resources or other web 2.0 uh, tools. We have, we're bound to, uh, to, ask, to have to ask governments or at institutions to start regulating uh, on this use. Of course, this brings uh, several problems, but we can, uh, I can address it on, uh, on the different occasion. Basically, uh, getting to these conclusions on how OER and the lifelong learning can, um, can, be, can relate in order to achieve the Education for All um, goal, UNESCO goal, I would just sum up in these uh, several uh, eight or nine conclusions. First of all, OER can be powerful tools for social inclusion, lifelong learning, and the dissemination of transversal competencies, as we've seen. Secondly, the open philosophy being open source, open content, open resources, open innovation, implies necessarily the changing of the business and organizational models. And of course, it uh, implies that organizations adjust to a new work philosophy based on sharing. And it, this is not a very easy thing to do. Thirdly, quality standards have to be applied to open educational resources. Um, this doesn't mean necessarily that we have to standardize um, open educational resources, but some quality criteria has to be applied. And these, of course, have to be include the possibility of tutoring and certification, as I've uh, uh, pointed out earlier. Of course, uh, sustainability models have to be applied as well to open educational resource institutional strategies, fostering public-private partnerships and joint, joint funding. Because some, well, the main topic regarding this is not uh, how we're get, getting the money to uh, to build or to, to to build the open educational resources, but how are getting how are, are we getting the money to update the resource? And that is quite fundamental because, of course, the, result, the, the knowledge has its own life cycle. And, of course, these, uh, uh, these tools can be, um, um, have to be updated. And who is going to pay for that? Also, OER should adopt differenti differentiated pedagogical strategies and localized content. This is the multiple language problem. In the moral project, I didn't uh, have much time to explain it, the, the, one of the basic uh, um, things that uh, his basic characteristics was the fact that a same course was offered in 12 different languages. But that put it a, a tremendous problem, which was how to pay for the translation costs. And of course, that is a very important issue because uh, that again brings, brings us to the sustainability problem. But of course, it, uh, if the, 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 the resource is not translated and localized culturally, that of course uh, also brings a lot of problems to its use and its e learning effectiveness. As well, of course, new multi-platform technology standards and tools have to be implemented. This of course is, uh, is clear. Students and trainees has to have to contribute and start contributing to the design of the variant courses and resources they use. And that of course, once again, bring us to a change in culture regarding the, the organization and functioning of uh, higher education uh, institutions. And finally, 
resource repositories have to be maintained by network communities and no longer by single institutions. And this, of course, is uh, uh, related as well to the, uh, to the conclusion or one of the conclusions of the experience of the open learn, which, may, which in a way changed uh, the organization itself to, uh, to become aware that the knowledge, the production of knowledge, the production of content, better still, the production of content wasn't just um, something that